I just got a big delivery of edge fingerboards and I'm just going through them, checking them all and packaging them all up. And I just thought in this post, I would go through some observations and things that I've experienced through talking with climbers about fingerboarding over the past year. Um, a while ago last year, I made a video about how to hangboard that covered a lot of the, the fundamentals of how to actually do a hangboard workout and what uh, aspects of it are important and what are maybe less important. So the first thing I should say is that I'm really glad to see the popularity of fingerboarding has continued to increase and increase over the past few years. I think really it's helped propel a lot of climbers to much higher levels as it did for me. And as that popularity has increased, uh, more and more people have paid more and more attention to the details of fingerboarding, which is also great. One aspect of the details of fingerboards is of course the design. Now I'm highly biased because I designed this fingerboard, so I obviously really like it. The primary thing that I like about the Edge fingerboard is its simplicity. It just has the three rungs, and so it focuses your, your training naturally onto what's important, which is pulling as hard as you can. Now a really interesting theme that's emerging in the world of fingerboarding uh, revolves around data and data collection. One interesting piece of feedback or questions that I get from people who are considering buying one of these is to ask me what the rung depths are uh, so that they can compare them to other well-known brands of fingerboard. And this is a curious question for me. Actually, when I've been asked that question, I need to go and look it up myself because I don't hold that in my head because I don't think it's important. <laughs> the main thing really that I worry about in my fingerboarding is the directionality of the change in my strength rather than how it compares to different fingerboards. If I go and train on a different fingerboard in a different climbing wall, I don't worry about how I compare because I'm not really measuring my strength on a, on a session by session basis. I do periodic assessments of my strength level, but not all the time because it's not, it's not required. When we designed the rung depths for the edge board, we didn't do it by any sort of specific criteria or comparison to any other standard because, well, there isn't really one. And even if there was, I'm not sure that, that would be that important. Uh, the way that these were designed was by feel um, and by what actually feels natural and comfortable to hold on to um, so that there is no, there is no barriers. There's nothing in the way to enjoying as much as one does enjoy pulling as hard as you can on the fingerboard. So the biggest rung is really simple. It's just a big, comfortable jug rung to hold on to for warming up or doing basic upper body strength work on. The small rung, I think, is both also really comfortable to hold, but it's also a good size in that for a good chunk of the bell curve of strength in the total climbing population might find that they can comfortably hold this hold with two hands with minimal or even no additional weight and that will hit about the right strength level but with that said for everyone they are constantly needing to adjust the loading either by adding weight to themselves or uh, taking away uh, fingers and doing getting closer to holding the hold with one hand and if you want to see more detail on that please do watch my how to hangboard video now I mainly use well, I use the top rung for warming up on, but I mainly use the middle rung on the edge fingerboard and I hardly ever use the bottom rung at all. Now, the reason for that is because I have roughly equal grip strength across the different grip types. And that's really what I'm aiming for. I think that's a good thing. Um, and in the main, I can, I can hang the middle rung with one hand just. And if I'm a little bit heavier or the conditions are poor, sometimes I'm slightly on the wrong side of that, 100% of my body weight, so I need to get a tiny bit of support, maybe a, a kilo or two kilos um, with my other hand. And if I'm on the strong side, I can do a bit better than hanging with my body weight. So I either add a small amount of weight, very small amount of weight, or more often I just do a pull-up um, or a, a few pull-ups on, on one arm. <laughs> when I say a few, I mean one or two and that adds a little bit more load, so I get to the right load. Now, this board is a little bit more expensive than some of the other boards around, um, and that's because it's made from sustainable wood. And I, I do appreciate that climbers are willing to pay that little bit extra uh, for that sustainability, and I think that's a, a really good thing. So given that the fingerboard and other basic strength methods of, of training are very measurable, they tend to be measured. Now, there's a saying in engineering 
what gets measured gets managed. Measuring things, generally speaking, is a good thing in sports science. And I've been studying sports science my whole adult life, and so uh, I have a bias in favour of measuring things and tracking your progress with things. I think broadly it's a good thing. But in this post, I want to um, draw attention to some potential problems with measuring things to keep in mind. That's not to say that you shouldn't measure things, it's just to say that you need to make sure you're measuring the right things, uh, maybe more than one thing, and that you're also taking account of or adjusting for problems within the measurements you take. So I do, every so often, measure my performance on the fingerboard and various other strength exercises. And I, so I periodically keep track of that to know whether I'm going forwards or backwards with my strength. But those strength measurements are always kept within a context. They always have their place and are never allowed to um, be valued higher than, than they should be. So the ultimate measure for climbers is your climbing grade. So I certainly measure my climbing grade as the primary outcome measure of my training. Um, but as for the sub-measures of my training, well, I have all those strength measures, my performance on those, but they are only one component of your performance. As we know, climbing is a very technical sport. That is really the main metric that's of importance. Unfortunately, measuring climbing technique is exceptionally difficult. There is a few people who've had a stab at doing it. And in fact, I've been involved in some discussions around how you might go about doing that. And it's extremely difficult to the point that I've felt that perhaps the methods that we have to quantify and measure climbing technique are just not good enough at this point to make it worthwhile doing. Now, I would be delighted if someone could prove me wrong on that, um, but I just haven't seen it yet. So the point here is that although I keep track of the things that can easily be measured in climbing, that is, you know, how many kilograms of force I can apply to this rung, uh, I also keep in mind that there is a more important me measure but it's a measure I, that I cannot measure, which is my climbing technique, and that I must keep track of that in a more unfor informal, uh, qualitative way, if you like, of how I feel, and also um, other ways of, of observing my climbing technique, such as video and such as comparing with other climbers. But in particular in this post, I'd like to draw attention to a potential problem with collecting data that maybe didn't apply in climbing several years ago, but maybe starting to apply now. Because more and more people are using standard fingerboards and are uh, comparing themselves against set data sets that people are starting to collect, and that is a great thing, there is a potential problem with that, which uh, might be worth being mindful of. And this problem is known as Goodhart's Law. Now, Goodhart's Law comes from the world of economics, not from the world of sport and exercise science, but nonetheless it applies to any aspect of data collection. Now, in its formal language, Goodhart's Law is that any observed statistical regularity will tend to collapse once pressure is placed on it for control purposes. But in plain language, Goodhart's Law is that once something becomes a target, it ceases to become a good measure. Let's say you want to achieve a certain grade, let's say that grade is 8A, and you test your ability to, your pure finger strength ability, your ability to hang off one of these rungs, and then you decide, okay, I'm going to try and improve that aspect of my technique, and then you improve it by a set percentage, um, and then you, you assess how much further that's got you towards that, that target grade. Now that's fine, and that's a really good thing to do, but you must also be mindful of the effect of targeting your training around that sub-goal of improving your, your finger strength on all the other aspects, especially your technique in climbing. So there's an effect even at an individual level of focusing too much on the pure finger strength as your outcome measure and potentially becoming distracted from the other components, especially those that are hard to measure on your total climbing performance. But there's also a wider problem that's starting to emerge for climbers. As organisations start to collect standardised data on what someone's finger strength should be for a given grade, then you can start to build a model around that and say, um, people who can climb 8A have a certain level of finger strength, and if you fall in the middle of that model, then you're normal. And if, you, if you're very strong, but your grade is very poor, then you can make inferences about that. Or if your finger strength is very poor, then you might think, oh, that might be my main target. 
for improving my climbing grade. Now that's all fine with baseline data, but what happens if that is what tends to be measured and that's what climbers in the prevailing culture for several years value? What effect does that have on the model? Well, hypothetically, what you might see is that climbers as a whole cohort get dramatically stronger in a kind of outsized effect compared to improvements in their climbing technique. So what you might find is that today, after that intervention has been made, climbers who can climb AT will tend to be stronger, but let's hypothetically say they also tend to have poorer technique. So what was normal before has shifted and it's also become abnormal. So if you compare yourself to that new normal, that may give misleading data. The first time I ever became aware of this idea was many years ago when uh, a friend and climbing partner commented to me that, um, that they had a goal to be able to climb Font 7C, that is V9 bouldering, um, because that was a subset goal towards climbing 8C or 14B root grade. And they felt that anyone who can climb Font 7C should be able to climb 8C root. And I remember bursting out laughing. <laughs> Because I thought, what? Like most people, including myself at that time, I could climb Font 7C, no problem. Um, but my limit was 8B route and I could not progress past that. In my view, Font 8A plus V12 was equivalent to 8C route. So the implication of what my friend was saying was that um, if you have enough strength to climb Font 7C, your technique should do the rest or all the totality of the climbing skills, your technique, tactics, psychological skills, everything that come under the total um, list of components that add up to your, your climbing ability. That if you could climb Font 7C, you had that one strength component, then that should fall into place to add up to a level of 8C. And I thought that kind of underestimated the strength you would need to have to climb that grade. But that was interesting because I thought, well, why does he have that different view? And I laughed even more because around the same time, I had a, a different conversation with a different climbing partner who said that he had a personal climbing goal of a, a spread of grades that, in his view, were equivalent, which was 8A boulder, 8A route, and E4 trad. <laughs> and I remember bursting out laughing again because I just thought, no, no, that's like, that, that's skewed in the opposite direction. I know people who the only bit of wood they ever hang on to is a bar, like a pub, drinking beer, and they can climb E4. <laughs> There's a lot of very, very unfit climbers who can climb E4 trad um, if you're as old school as I am. You can, if you can climb 8A boulder, you should definitely be able to climb a lot harder than 8A sport. So this illustrates the problem at a basic level. The culture that you hang out in determines what the norms are. If everyone is really into their bouldering and measuring their finger strength and hanging off fingerboards, then you might find a lot of climbers who can climb 8A boulder 80 sport and E4 trad. <laughs> and if you hang around a lot of people who climb on rock a lot and have a huge amount of experience um, and knowledge about, about rock climbing itself and all the technical and tactical aspects of that, then you might find more people who can climb 8C but can only climb Font 7C boulder and are decidedly unimpressive on the fingerboard. <laughs> so the next question is, what do you do about this problem? Well, I mean, I think at a basic level, you're just, it's just important to be mindful of it. If you're mindful of it and keep an eye on your technique and, and keep an eye on looking at, be caref be, being careful about who you compare yourself to, then that usually is enough to, to get around that problem. Another thing is for uh, people who are actually doing data modeling and, and creating normative data for climbers, is that you can keep track of and correct for Goodhart's law to a certain extent. So if you're relying on coaches to collect that data and advise you on that data, I think maybe just ask them how they actually correct for that problem. I'm off to go and do a fingerboard workout now. And um, as I say, every so often I will think about and monitor what my actual strength is on the fingerboard and how that relates to my overall climbing performance. But in a given session, what I'm more measuring from from set to set as I do my hangs is level of effort. And for me, fingerboarding is a never ending quest to get another muscle fiber to fire as I'm giving it even more effort than I thought was possible.